Welcome to a very special edition of the Western Bulldogs podcast, the Glory Days uh, podcast. Um, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome one of my very dear friends, one of my former teammates and a man. He's a man of acquaintances and many, many, many interests. And often when you ask someone, what have you been up to? You sort of half listen to the response. Not with Will Minson. When you ask Will what he's been up to, he generally has something interesting to offer. And today he delivers again because, Will, welcome to Glory Days, but you don't look like you're in Melbourne. You look like you're in some tropical paradise. How are you and welcome? I'm well, thanks, Bob. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Going um, going really well. Yeah, stroke, <laughs> a ge- stroke a genius a couple of weeks ago. We had a, uh, uh, a holiday planned. I've just finished uh, work at one company and we'll be starting at another one in uh, a couple of weeks' time and took the opportunity for a break and we were staring down the barrel of our two-week holiday being destroyed by COVID and uh, quickly moved it forward a few days and it's proven to be a very successful uh, decision because I've spent the last two weeks here um, on the beach in Port oh. Douglas. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> start most mornings with, uh, with, a, with a walk looking for fish with a fly rod in hand and spend the rest of the day playing tennis. So it's been a good two weeks, Bob. Uh, I'm so jealous. There's a, and, and I'm happy for you. I'm happy for you. You've, uh, um, you've been working hard. I know that. So you, you've earned yourself um, a good holiday. Um, I assume Sarah's with you. I hope I hope Sarah's with you. Yeah, Sarah's with me. She's yeah. um yeah, she's she's taken to the beach pretty well. Um, okay. <laughs> it's, 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 it's been a good like she had a particularly tough year. I mean, as uh, as you've probably covered with all your um, hosts, uh COVID affected people in all sorts of different ways. I was working 14 hour shifts all day, you know, last year. Um down at Werribee and she had no work and was at home and it was pretty tough, that sort of difference between the two experiences. So um, we're looking forward to this holiday and we're very grateful that it was able to to happen. I'm glad to hear that. Are the the fish biting? uh... It's been been tough. I sit here in 25 degrees and all the locals are uh, wearing jumpers and telling me how cold it is. So um, Do they they really think it's cold or is that just a thing? (laughs) It's extraordinary. Everyone I speak to is, oh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm pretty keen on barramundi. And you, you mentioned the barramundi word to anyone. I was like, oh, no, too cold. They're turned off. It's, you know, the change of the seasons. Uh, right. the, pool, the pool here at this place, there was a note in the Airbnb which said, um, you can request to have the pool heater turned on on the 1st of June as that is the commencement of winter. <laughs> so uh, we're like, okay, well, let's let's turn the pool heater on. But, um, yeah, it's quite funny because they, no, they are genuinely like – we. Uh, we went out to the reef the other day for snorkel, and the the woman yeah. on the boat she had a polar fleece on. <laughs> it was 30, <laughs> thirty-seven degrees of polar fleece. I'm just like, yeah, it's there. Yeah. yeah, of course she did. Um, so you mentioned um, in between work, uh, what have you been up to since? Um, well, since your footy days finished, because you embarked on the longest university degree in the southern hemisphere. I, I I'm assuming you finished. Um, your uni degree. What's work been like? What were you, what have you been doing, and what's uh, what's what's next in store for you? For the last three years, I've been working with McConnell Dow, which is a uh, a um, civil engineering firm, a civil construction company, and it's and it's been a fabulous three years. I really enjoyed it. it um, a few months ago, I accepted a position with a company called Alchemy, who are a, um, infrastructure and, and major transport, major infrastructure consultants, specialising in. Um, you know, project delivery and setting up teams for success, and that starts on the twenty first of twenty first of that of this month, which is why I'm up here having a break. Uh, what's your relationship with footy these days? Do you, I know you were doing some coaching at the Kangaroos for a little while. Tell me about that. Um, I understand you're not doing that currently. Do you, are you watching much footy? Do you have an interest in the dogs? Um, yes, of course. For, of course, I have an interest in the dogs. So I'll, I'll answer that one first. I dialed into the game um, last week against the against the Dockers, and you know there's some pretty exciting footy being played by the Dogs. I think they've always had um, in recent years a really attractive and exciting game style. Is genuinely you kind of want to watch it. Um, you know the, the level of skill, the way we move the ball so quickly, and you know, both sides of the body, and get it going any which way you can. Um, 
as it appears now from a spectator's perspective, um, is a great way to play footy. Um, and of course, all the guys that I play with, I thoroughly enjoy watching the likes of, you know, Libba and Jacko and Bont and, you know, Hans and JJ and all these kinds of guys. Um, who I, you know, as, as, as you would be, still very, feel very close with and, and enjoy seeing them do well. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll, as long as there's somebody out there that I've played with, then, you know, I'll be laying claim to, to them or even laying claim to their successes for something <laughs> that I told them. <laughs> My relationship this year is the first year of my adult life where I haven't had footy. Um, bar 2017, where we spent most of the year overseas, I didn't see any footy or watch any footy in 2017. Um, and then came back in 2018 and uh, came the ruck coach of the Kangaroos, and I really enjoyed that. Um, it was an opportunity presented to me that I didn't think, um, you know, I, I wasn't I wasn't pursuing it. I was at, at some point after coming back from overseas, I, I said to myself, it'd be great to get involved in footy again. And in my own head, I thought that would be local level football or or amateur amateur level football. And when the opportunity came from an AFL club, I was like, wow, that's 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 pretty special. I need to jump at this. And really glad I did. I had a fabulous time. Um, I'm still very passionate about Ruckman and, uh, and, and the role <laughs> the role of the role of rucking and and here was an opportunity to specialize in that and very grateful to the North Melbourne Footy Club. I enjoyed working with you know, Todd Goldstein and uh, you know, Tristan Sherry, who's um, you know, started his career last year in his you know, first handful of games, and um, Tom Campbell, who came across from the Dogs as well. It was great to work with um, you know young young and old cohort of Ruckman and, and the likes of Magic Door and um, Braden Pruce. These are the guys that I was able to coach for a handful of years. Yeah. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And then when when COVID hit, they all went up to uh, the Gold Coast in the bubble, it just wasn't possible for a for a consultant, for a you know, specialist coach to to travel up there. Yeah. Um, and so sadly, my you know, whilst I dialed into a handful of Zoom and Teams meetings in, in the beginning of that of that period, it's pretty hard to coach over over yeah, the yeah, internet. Yeah. Um, whilst I still maintain regular contact and, and call the guys and see how they're going. Um, yeah, COVID largely put an end to that. Yeah, as a result, it was the first time I had it life where I, I don't have mm. an expectation to be somewhere, to travel somewhere. Immediately, my mind went to, great, I'll get my weekends back. So so that'll be good. What about your own footy career? When when you look back and, and like, take me back to the very first game. Can you, what are your memories of that day and the and your, and your first minutes? Because I have some memories of, no doubt. of, of no doubt. those first couple of minutes when you ran onto the field. But what, 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 what are your recollections of that day 2004 we hadn't had a great deal of success the year before as you'll know um and 2004 was shaping up likewise as a tough tough season it was about round nine we came in against the blues and i mean i mean the crowd is something you 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 notice straight away in terms of um i remember chasing someone on the on the wing in the on the on the top member side i assume and um i laid a bump and the crowd sort of made a noise. Ooh, I was like, oh, that's amazing. I've got to go to another one. I laid another one. I ran around for the first 90 seconds just trying to bump as many people as I could just to get that response in the crowd. And uh, as you know, time with time, your performances only look better in, in the rearview mirror. Um, but I think I watched that game back only a few years ago for the first time, and I reckon 70% of what I did then would have been downfield free kick, <laughs> borderline, borderline reportable in the current. Um, current pettiness of AFL adjudicating. So, um, yeah, the, the, the you know, I think my first kick came from Ben Harrison. I think I jogged into the back line and he switched the play and very quickly put his finger up and told me where to kick it next. I think I booted it out of the back line. And then as you're probably about to lead me to, if I hadn't mentioned it, Bob put my hand up and said, I'm knackered, get me off. So um, I was ahead of my time in terms of player, player-led rotations. It wasn't the dumb thing back in 2004. <laughs> But I, um, I distinctly remember being complete. It was, it was shortly after I'd run around trying to bump as many people as I could, and then I got, got, took a mark and kicked it off, and then put my hand up and said, "Get me off." Um, I'm, so I'm not was, sure. I'm not sure what my memories are and what uh, just um, sort of convoluted memories of of Das Luke Darcy because he, I don't, he must have not been playing, I think, and was watching you closely. And he just said you ran on and went, 
can like you described, like a human cannonball into one, two, three, four, and then just put your hand up like I've got to come off because <laughs> I've completely busted my lungs. Um, you, you mentioned um, borderline reportable. You didn't wait long till you got reported. Second game, uh, you got rubbed out for three weeks. No, nah, third game, two weeks. Third Games game, played to game suspended ratio, one okay. and a half to one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so third game, uh, striking Cameron Ling out for a couple. Oh, hang on now. As you as you recall, I, I I can't have the record state incorrectly. It was a charging offence, not a strike. Charging, offense. right? Okay, charging. Um, and it was only as a result of um, he must have had a, some, I don't know, some weak nasal properties because he bled for reasons that weren't obvious to me and um, as a result of the bleeding incident they had to review it trial by video so um, the incident right. at the time was just deemed just a, just a bump uh, I remember Peter Riccardi had the ball in hands and he was he was going to handball to Lingy and then he saw me putting wonderful front of pressure on as you well imagine yep. and yep. as a yep. result yep. of the pressure I was applying he didn't handball to Ling. And so then when someone doesn't have the ball, as is the rules in AFL, you elect the bump. So uh, I bumped him and um, it was just deemed a, a late bump and free kick and carry on with the program. But as a result of the bleeding, which I don't know how it occurred, um, they reviewed it trial by video and it went to the tribunal like two weeks. Yeah. Um, is, this is all, you're not actually in the tribunal right now defending yourself, but I appreciate I appreciate the tone and the detail offered for the Glory Days podcast. Can we fast forward, Will, to um, to the year 2013, which was a pretty tough one for the Bulldogs in terms of uh, win loss, but probably um, the the personal high watermark of your career, you're an all Australian ruckman that year. Um, you had an incredible 860 hit outs, which is the tenth most of any player in a season of all time, which is quite an achievement. Um, was that the most you enjoyed your football that year? Is that too simple a way to describe it? Probably too simple, because as you would have, you know, as you, as you know, it's it's you really enjoy winning games of footy. And, and there was a confusing element to that. Um, I remember in previous years, you know, in, our, in our, the three prelims that we played in, in eight, nine, 10, sometimes mm. we would get, win games of footy and it would be, it'd be hard to get involved in sort of a, the pace of the game, the efficiency of ball use. You know, we, we, you know it had, from a Ruckman's perspective, once you'd done, the, done the, your work at the stop, the ball was gone. And we were such a fast moving um, team for so long. Um, so sometimes we win games of footy and I have no impact. It felt like very little impact on, on, on yeah. the result. Uh, and then 2013, I was having, um, you know, and, and 14, 12 and 13 were pretty similar um, in terms of my influence over the game, yet we weren't winning games of football. Now, as you know, it takes 22 players to win a game. It takes five players on a list. I think at one point in 2013, I remember Brendan McCartney coming to more than likely you and me and a few other senior people at the time saying, Will, we've got this player or this player to play. Who do you think we should play? There's literally two players left on the list that didn't have, hadn't had a game at that point. And, we're sort mm. of, and I think the question was actually around Ling Jong. We're like, play Jongy. Like he's, you know, get Jongy out there. We know how, how, how much of a you know, heart and soul player Ling Jong is at the time. He hadn't, um, he hadn't debuted yet and he came in and made an impact. But yeah, so it was, it was confusing because I was playing good football. I was in control. Um, every every AFL player craves consistency, and and that is something which a coach also um, loves when they whether it's yeah. good or bad. As long as it's consistent, they can work with it. And I think <laughs> 12, 12, 13, 14, I was as consistent um, as I you know the most consistent football I played throughout my whole career. So that gave me a lot of satisfaction knowing that each week I could go into a game um, and and you know provide a pretty similar level of of output. Yeah, I will say also the you know the game style we had back then was very suited to me. To me, we had a very um, numbers around the stoppage, congest the football. Um, it, it, you know, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't great. We didn't win a lot of footy. It was pretty tough. Uh, we were a brilliant stoppage team. We had pretty good numbers. I think we were almost at one point the best stoppage team in the competition. And as you know, it's not always a good thing to be the best in any statistic. Um, you know, we've had that presented to us before where, you know, you're better off being in the top four for many statistics rather than being the best in any one. 
and we were the best at sort of contested footy and and, and stoppages. So you know, that's a Ruckman's game, um, but we had a very slow game style, and yeah, so it was tough. But I but but equally, I built some great partnerships with the on ballers, um, you know, Griffin and Cooney and Liberatore in particular. They they generally make you look pretty good if you can put it somewhere near them, and I was able to do that. So. Um, but I do reflect on on that achievement. And, you know, if you if you interpret the All Australian selection to to mean you're the best player in that position of that year, that's something I'm I'm really proud of. And yeah. um, you know, I don't think there was you know, and it wasn't a uh, wasn't a substitute role. It was the you know the, the ruckman for 2013. I was the best in the country according to that um, definition, and I was really proud of that. Yeah. Um, the the accepted sort of um, rules of of clearance work and ruck work is the midfielders get together with the ruckman. They have a plan. We're going to hit it to this spot um, after the contest. Uh, you challenged that theory as a as a young man at the Bulldogs in your very early days, where I think it was Scott West that you told that instead of pre-planning where you were going to hit it. You were going to do what no other ruckman in the history of the game were doing, and and you would call the position you were going to hit it whilst jumping in the air. Do you feel like um, you were before your time, or have you implemented that into any of your ruck coaching, or is it something? Is it still the 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 next frontier for rucks? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure how clouded some of these are. Uh... How much how much time has distorted these things, Bob? But um, <laughs> um, but the communicating thing is a bit is a big thing, and you know I think that was one of our strengths uh, in the midfield during the 12, 13, sort of fourteen years was you know Tom Liberatore, his timing to call for the ball, um, to you know to just to make a noise so you know where they are. Something that that people that aren't ruckmen fail to you know to realise at times is when you're spending all your time looking up here. When you're up here, you don't actually know what's going on beneath you. So if it's not the people making noises, calling for the ball, mm. um, it's and often you get you, know, you get spun, you get hit, you get knocked where you think you are is not where you are three milliseconds later. And just a little voice, something that says, you know, put it here, makes the world of difference. And, you know, that was a challenge point at the Kangaroos. Yeah. They, they, they don't call for the ball. Like, you know, Ben Cunnington, one of the greatest – Stoppage plays in the game. Um, he and Goldie would barely talk to each other when the ball's in the air. It's extraordinary. I'll be pulling my hair out. So like, you guys have got to say something. Just make a noise, grunt, fast. I don't care. Just do something so that Goldie knows where you are. <laughs> and there's nothing, you know, a little bit of gesturing, a little bit of hand signals before the ball up. And, you know, um, so trying to bring about that change in terms of, look, here's an opportunity, call for the ball. Now, you led with, did I tell everyone just to hold – hold tight until I was hanging in suspended in the air and then wanted to make a determination of where it was and then I would hit it and place it out. Maybe not. Um, I don't think it would, I don't think you quite do it like that, but you can certainly change. Like if you, especially Ruckman that jump in early and hit body and then you get a little bit of a time where you're hanging, um, especially if you've been able to displace them, you're underneath the ball, you, you've got time to maybe even let it lower before you hit it. And if you hear things, you can change. And um, if you don't hear anything, you're like, well, where are you? I don't know where you are. What's going on? And then you yeah. grab it and then everyone yells at you for grabbing it. Well, they did in my time because, you're, I mean, geez, this ridiculous rule, Bob, that a ruckman is allowed to grab the ball and not be penalised for not disposing of it correctly <laughs> is beyond me. Like, it <laughs> is just, just dumbed down the role so much. If you grab the ball and don't dispose of it, fine. That's the new rule. But if you grab the ball and dispose of it illegally, these ruckmen should be penalised for this. It's just insane that they've allowed can just, I just to grab it and drop it. Can I just congratulate you for, for getting 30 minutes into this podcast before you turned on the umpires? You did drift into criticising the rule makers and the AFL and the tribunal, but you just pulled it back. Well done on lasting this long in terms of giving. Well, like it I said, I'm still passionate. Like you asked me, where am I at with football? I'm passionate about the game. Right. I'm passionate about rucking, and um, football is still an emotive um, sport. And sure people is. still yell at the TV screen. They still, you know, yell at their iPhones. Um, I still yell at some of the ridiculous decisions that have been made in the rules. 
I, I, love, I just love hearing the passion still there. Now, we don't have heaps of time left, but I, we do this thing on Glory Days occasionally. We call it Dog Tales, um, where we, we replay a bit of footage and, and you can sort of talk us through it. But you, in your 191 games, you kicked 81 goals, which I which is a, a great achievement. I actually thought the 81, there would have been more of them because, I mean, you celebrated with such passion and um, intensity for a lot of them. Um, you were a player, my, in all the players that I played with, no one asked more questions in the history of the football club in my time than you. Um, on this particular day, uh, you, you had the answer. It wasn't about the questions, it had the answer. But I just want to play you this bit of footage and just, uh, just some of your recollections from this because of the 81 goals you kicked, this was by far the most dramatic. Cooney loads up to full form. The Flyers like from the clouds. He's got to look up quickly. He's got to play in the square. He's cramped. Go away, go away. And the clock hasn't stopped. It's still running. Come on, Ump. Thank you. Well, this is interesting. He kicked the first goal. I reckon he's faking this. <laughs> he's not necessarily the bloke you want to have the ball in the hands off to kick a goal after the siren. Jeez, so Minson's got it. What? Gee, this is interesting. So how injured is Brian Lake right now? And what's the point of reference for the umpire, forward or back in that situation? I've got no idea. Obviously closest to goal. I think he's just trying to even up the equation. What a finish. Well, speaking of evening up, Tim, if Will kicks it, that's what we've got. He's kicked two today. Looking OK. Looking very good. Schwartzy. So, I mean, we can talk about Lakey's, uh, the mark and the... Uh, the injury for for a while. What what was going through your head at the time? Because by my eye, you were the probably the fourth closest to having legitimate claims we should to get, that. We should get cons- um, a consensus that there's no way in the world that I was the next person. No, nah. that should have taken a get like that. Not that we're going to go back and and change <laughs> change the result, but like that extraordinary, really. Like, how is it that I came to be that that ball was? Like, you know, I joked at the time, I was like, who did they think was least likely to kick the goal? Let's give it a will, like, you know, some sort of self-deprecating statement like that. But, um, you know, I really don't understand how. And then when I watch that, I mean, it gets played all the time. It's been it's been rerun for years, that bit of footage. You, you particularly like it because Brownie celebrates at the end after a draw. Um, that usually gets a mention. But how on earth did I end up with that ball? Uh, it's. I think is it Tim Watson, the commentator there. I think he might. I think he might have called it um, perfectly. So he, he he immediately questions the legitimacy of the injury immediately, and then I think I think that because Gilbs was in and around, and and at that point was probably considered the best kick in the league, and so when he got it, it all looked a bit. Maybe the umpires look look not so yeah, just a bit of you know what. Will was around. I'm not having the Bulldogs completely manipulate this. Will gets the ball. Well, um, I know. You, I know this is one of the most. They didn't um, know. They didn't realise that you were an, as such an accomplished set shot as you were. You you were a beautiful set shot though. Uh, I benefited from playing pretty close to goal at times. So uh, I remember when Scott Welsh came to the Footy Club. He was in the goal square. We had Brad Johnson playing across half forward, and I, I was in the forward pocket. So um, Ben Hudson starting the ruck, pretty strong midfield, Cooney and Eagleton, and, and I think you were even across half back. But you might have been still half forward at that time, Bob. You know, the yep. ball was coming in pretty regularly. So I was given plenty of opportunity, and often it would be the lead up players, that, if they weren't used, I was the sort of the next option closer to the goal. So I remember one yeah, that year, I. I had a lot of shots from 20 and 30 metres out, which um, helps with the statistics. Um, a question I have for you, Bob, is in the footage, you might even have to dig the footage back out again. I kicked the goal, instant adrenaline rush, ex- ex- exhilaration, ex- you know, full yeah, bangs, euphoria, yeah. And fist pump somewhere within your vicinity. I might have had a little sneaky look to the crowd. 
you were a little bit disappointed with my rack. Do you recall being disappointed with my <laughs> response to kicking the goal? <laughs> no, no. Are you sure? I was quite, were, 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 were I was you quite angry? militant at the time. Were you angry or? Because uh, if you I look know. back at the footage, you, I'm pretty sure you punched me, is my recollection of this. <laughs> you punched me and, and said, like, don't you ever do that again or something like that. Um, in, 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 in the two times I remember you really yelling at me on the footy field. <laughs> Here's one for you. We're playing at Subiaco. Talk about glory days. We're playing at Subiaco. Now, I was only telling somebody yesterday when they were talking about how amazing the Optus Oval is. I said that the worst thing Western Australia could have done for its people is get rid of um, Subiaco because it was such an intimidating ground. Such oh, yeah. A, such a different game of footy. Like, you don't, almost don't pick, you know, despite having one of the greatest ruckmen ever, that, you know, in Dean Cox, you almost don't pick ruckmen because, one, you have to play against Dean Cox, and, two, you have to play it on, play it on the biggest ground in the country. Mm. Um, but you go to Subiaco, it's a whole kick and a half longer than anywhere else, and I was running down the wing, and it was one of the first times, I remember that you, you, you might recall this when we played Richmond, if Darren Gasper ever got the ball, you'd let him have it. And I just yeah, thought, yeah. wow, that's that's phenomenal. Like, we let him have it. Yeah, it's like going to get turned over. And so um, that was new to me that you would let someone have the ball. Well, the first time I experienced people doing that to me was at, <laughs> was at Subiaco and I'm running down the wing and they're running away from me. I'm like, and it twigs. It was like, shit, they actually want me to kick the ball here. <laughs> and, and you were within vicinity for maybe a handball. I took a bounce and then and it was like, they're still getting further away from me. I don't know if I took a second bounce. But I just unleashed this massive barrel, just a full 49 and a half meter barrel on the wing. And you yelled out right then in that millisecond, if you ever do that again, Wish, well, I will bash you. <laughs> That's what you said. <laughs> oh, geez. I will bash you after I kicked a barrel on the wing at Subiaco. And, it, you know, it probably would have been, you know, out of bounds, deliberate in current interpretation. But, um, yeah, I just kicked it over the back and, um, so yeah, that's 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 Subiaco. Remember that's right. But this one, I've kicked well, the goal against that, the Tigers, that, well, well, and you're disappointed. You're angry with me about something. So I don't know what it was. The only thing I could think of being, I mean, we we you'd kicked it to level it up. So maybe I was wanting to snap back into us still having time to win. That's the only thing I can think <laughs> of for being for having yeah. the the shits with you there. Uh, as for the talk, that that is a story of overconfidence, isn't it? You you kicking. Torps on the run, and then me threatening to bash six foot six, hundred and twelve kilogram teammate Will Minson. Uh, that's well, a story. The, the pressure of the West, as you know, yeah. Jeez, that, yeah. you know that. <laughs> the oh, misguided um, uh, overconfidence. Um, is it true, Will? You, you were MC at your brother Hugh's wedding, and. You, you did some creative work with some junior football of his and some special commentary. Can you, can you fill, fill me in on, on that story? Yeah, so, so my younger brother Hugh was uh, going to be a superstar a footballer and so much so I think in his last season of footy as an under nine or something, he was the, uh, the best footballer in the league. He got the medal and his first game of the next season, he dislocated his kneecap and uh, I think he even broke part of his kneecap, which started a... Um, you know, the journey of knee operations and, and basically by the time he was 17 or 18, I think he'd already had three knee surgeries, which is no way for a developing yeah. body, you know, to, you know. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. he ended up getting drafted to Port Adelaide, um, but he just wasn't able to withstand um, the demands of, of AFL on a bone-on-bone knee at age, you know, 20. So if he was yeah. 30 and getting paid half a million a year, you inject it and keep playing. But when you're 20 trying to start your career, it's sort of um, – so, yeah, and he hasn't, he hasn't run since. So, um, yeah. Hugh, uh, anyway, so I bring that up because, he, you know, he, he, he and I had a, a really close relationship as kids and, and loved footy and we played our whole lives and then all of a sudden his footy career ended and I was able to um, deliver out my dreams. So I was always very conscious that um, to Hugh, he wasn't able to, to do what I'd been able to do. and an AFL career. So um, I dug out some footage. I actually asked him, I said, Hugh, when you sent that uh, VCR footage of your footy to, to, to the you know, digital converters, can I have the link for it? He was worried I was going to do something for a buck party or something like this. I said, no, 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 it's like, well, actually fine. I just got the footage. So anyway, I got the footage and um, one of the uh, 
the staff at the Kangaroos who now works at the, at the Bulldogs, Ben Redfern, um, very kindly um, edited it and put it into like a highlights reel. And yeah. um, so I got this highlights reel and I called up none other than uh, you better, you better, I'm Rex Hunt, you're not. And we sat down and Rex commentated and, and, and put audio to the under nine's highlights package. And it was just spectacular. And so at the wedding, he married an American woman and half the crowd had no idea what footy was. And, um, you know, some people have, and, you know, have been told by friends and family that I played footy and that's what I made a career of and that you could have done likewise. And so I thought only fit for them to, 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 to learn a football for the first time was to produce this highlights footage of Hugh. I said, look, here's this footage of my younger brother um, playing under nines, his last full season of footy. Um, little did anyone know, but there were some, some, some commentators at the game because I knew it was a big deal. And I rolled out Rex Hunt and the, like the second, the first words were sort of <laughs> spoken, you know, 50% of the audience were just like, that is that. Is that, is that who, and it was so it was done so well that it was almost like they thought he was actually there for the game, and you know I know it had an impact on Hugh. He was he burst into tears straight away. He couldn't believe it. we we you know we've been lovers of Rex Hunt our whole lives. We watch Rex Hunt fishing adventures every you know every weekend. We our fishing has been a big part of all our lives. Um, you know our late father took us fishing most weekends when we could. Uh, so with the three boys in the family, we've always bonded over fishing. I'm sitting here right now. I've got three fly rods rigged up, and I'll get off this phone call at some point and go and have a cast out here. But I, but you know, Rex Hunt is such a legend and such a phenomenal entertainer. Um, there's always a conversation at the pub: who's your favourite commentator? Who's who's you know who's the best caller of the game? And no one's ever come close for the entertainment factor of Rex Hunt. And here we were, a small island, Kauai, in in in, in Hawaii, and. Uh, Rex Hunt was blurting out highlights of, of my younger brother's other nice footage. And that is just, a great story. Oh, I'm sure Hugh would have been absolutely blown away. That's a that's a lovely thing for a, a brother a brother to do. Um, can I can I just rattle through some of your hobbies? And there's there's many that I'm missing. I just want a quick update because um, through your footy career, these things were trotted out to the point of sort of a cliche, really, to, towards the end. Um, you were kind of pigeonholed with them. But I just want a, qu- a quick update on how's the saxophone? Is it, if you picked it up, can you actually play it? I can actually play it. And no, I haven't picked it up in a while. Uh, as a guest of my wedding, Bob, you'll remember that um, I was, I was uh, you know, reminded by my best man that, uh, Will, everybody's heard that you can play the clarinet. We'd really love to, you know, <laughs> to really see this. And, uh, said, and lo and behold, he pulled out a clarinet and I, um, I played a few notes at my wedding. Uh, that was the last time I. That was the first time I played in a long time. Um, unfortunate for me was that the gentleman that, that uh, pulled out the clarinet at my wedding was a lecturer at ANU in Canberra and a spectacular musician. And he, he played some played some you know music afterwards. And there was like, oh, so that's what it's supposed to sound like. So the thing I did best throughout my career was I never played it for anyone, so I'm never able to disprove the, the quality of my musicianship. Um, but I did. Well, I actually pulled it out of the cupboard the other day. Kid you not, first time since the wedding, I thought, oh, shit, I was tidying up the cupboard. I thought, oh, I'll just get it out. And I played for 15 minutes. And, but I used to play the sax in the morning of the game, and I, I think it was actually a very good, calming, and something I realise now with my lack of aerobic fitness is uh, a wind instrument requires you know, good breathing capacity. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I used to, throughout my schooling, I played every day for multiple hours. Like easily, yeah. year 12, I would have played one and a half, two hours every day. And it was great for your, for your lung capacity. Don't have that much anymore. What about the German? Has the um, has the has the linguistics? Well, I'm up here in Port Douglas, and sadly, without the without the without the German tourists, uh, the backpackers are, are missing. You know, the opportunity is gone for, a, for another bout of practice. But um, we can you, say, spent can some... you say go Bulldogs in German for me? Los Gates Bulldogs. Um, <laughs> We, we, we finished our honeymoon, actually, of all places, in Oktoberfest, and that is a phenomenal party. I've been to maybe three times now. Um, we did some hiking and climbing in Austria after, you know, a handful of days of Oktoberfest. And, you know, what a, you know, to think you'd have, what, six million people, I think, attend Oktoberfest yeah, yeah, every, yeah. every year. Like, it's a crazy number of people. Sadly, it wouldn't be going ahead at the moment. Um, yeah, I can, I can still still speak some German when we fly. Pilot's license. Have you been clocking up some miles in the air? Yeah, flying's been great, actually, Bob. Um, I've been doing my tailwheel endorsement recently. Uh, airplanes either have a 
tricycle gear, which is three wheels at the front, or they have a uh, what's called a tail wheel, which is a wheel at the back of the airplane, and you cut with like an old warbird. Um, I've been flying one of those planes, a fully aerobatic, which I hope to start doing, getting upside down and messing around with in a couple of weeks' time. But um, the the flying is very much just a means of of, of transportation around the country. My wife's family lives in the middle of New South Wales. It's a twelve hour drive or a three and a half hour flight. So we went up for Easter, had a great time up there. Did about ten hours flying that week and visited some friends in Orange on the way home. And then the weather turned bad and spent an extra two days in Orange and um, you know came back to Melbourne a day and a half late. But um, yeah, the flying's fabulous. Really enjoy it. It's, 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 a, it's a great pastime. And I, w- I would have asked you about fly fishing, but clearly I can I can sense the and you mentioned them before the three fly fishing rods are, are rigged up, ready to go. Um, uh, are you, I, you, you? I think you mentioned before that after this holiday in Port Douglas, you, you're heading off to the Tiwi Islands for for red dust, and red dust, of course, um, was at least uh, one of the founders was um, John Van Gronigan. Um, I know a man who's very special um, to you and and me, but but you know you were particularly close with John, and, and he had an important role at the Bulldogs. And to this day, the Players Player Award is still the the John oh. Van Gronigan Award. Um, uh, tell us about the Red Dust experience and your, and your commitment to yeah. To, uh, so to their um, program. Red Dust really has been the greatest thing aside from football that has come from my footy career and my time at the Bulldogs to, to, to have met John and to have been invited out to a remote community for the first time as an 18 year old. Um, it was, you know, just, it was generally life changing. It's pretty cliched terminology, but I've, I've tried to spend a week in community every year, um, from that time, from that first time in 2004. So is that nearly 17 or well, 2003 I went out. So nearly 18 years involved with red dust, which I'm, I'm really proud of, but we're a, um, we're a, a health and well-being um, program that delivers um, a, you know, a whole community program in, in, in the Northern Territory where we tackle things from substance abuse and um, general health and well-being to um, sport and education, that kind of stuff. So we've um, been deli- we've been partnering with nearly I think it's seven or eight communities now that we've had you know over 25 years um, delivery, which we're really proud of. Um, uh, something that I do miss, um, as you might too, is the 10 week annual leave that you get as a footballer. Like, it's just an extraordinary to think that, you know, you mm. definitely you work your backside off, um, you get paid well. Um, but then the, the, you know, the two, two and a half months that you get at the end of the season is a great opportunity to, to get away and, and, and to volunteer and do all sorts of things. Um, with a different job that, uh, certainly is not the wage of, of an AFL footballer. And with four weeks annual leave, it makes it a bit harder to, um, to get out our bush, but yeah. I've, I've used this opportunity with a change of jobs to to get out to the Tiwi Islands, which I'm really excited about. A place I know you've been to. It's just a spectacular part of the world. Um, really strong culturally. Um, you know, obviously all the Rialis and the Longs um, is a pretty pretty famous name up in uh, you know in Australian football, and I, I get the privilege to 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 go to their country and to um, deliver. You know, I think next week we're running a an athletics carnival. We're going to help them out with our athletics carnival. And last time I was in the Tiwis, we, we taught the kids up there Frosby flop, and discus, and shot put, and everything, and baton relay changes for a whole for a whole four days. And on the fifth day, when we we're going to run the carnival, we had about a meter and a half of rain, and <laughs> athletics carnival didn't go ahead. We just had a whole of school game of footy. We played for about four hours and just nonstop footy in just torrential downpour. So hopefully the rain holds off. Um, but yes, yeah, so um, I could talk forever about red dust. So my bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's um, it's important work. Um, and you know, an incredible legacy that that red dust leaves, and particularly you know, the work that um John Van Groningen did. He was one of the most special people you could ever possibly meet. Um, as are you, Will. It's always um fascinating and a joy for me to chat to you. We don't get to do it often enough these days. Um. I'd love you to take me out fishing at some stage because I've recently uh, got the bug. Um, but in a football sense, you had a fascinating uh, career. You you are genuinely much loved by the Bulldog faithful. Um, spectacular, um, emotional, um, and uh, apart from a couple of moments uh, of threatened violence, 
from my behalf towards you. <laughs> I genuinely love playing with you. Um, I miss I miss the locker room. I miss I miss running out next to you. It was always nice to have you next to me um, in the same jumper. So, um, mate, well, have a nice break. Have a nice holiday. Give my love to Sarah. Um, and uh, and we'll uh, catch you down the road. Yeah, well, I'll uh, get back when the quarantine lifts and um, come over. I haven't seen the kids in a while. It'll be good to say, see you all. Beautiful. God bless you, my friend. Thanks, Bob. <laughs>